So first up is Red Ranger's Dinozord, the Tyrannosaurus Dinozord. This is actually one of the most posable uh, component Zords that we ever got in a Power Rangers toy line. Didn't happen very often, but when it did, it's pretty awesome. Nice detailed tail. The only thing I didn't like about it was that it had that little, little nub sitting on the end there. I don't know why that's there. Because of transformation, you can do that. This is very loose, by the way. 15 years will do that. And then the tail is capable of folding up and down, but actually snaps into position down there. In the prototype pre-production pictures for the Megazord, which, by the way, I still have that box. If you looked inside the mouth of the Tyrannosaurus, there was actually a decal that was supposed to be sitting in there. Uh, you can actually still find, you can feel an indent in there. I don't know if my camera will pick it up, but uh, yeah. Head can go up and down because of transformation. Actually, not necessarily because of transformation, because if it was just transformation, the head would have been like this all the time. Because, you know, in the 80s, they changed how the Tyrannosaurus Rex walks about. Can you believe this, ladies and gentlemen? Originally, they used to think the T-Rex would walk around like this. Actually, it might have been a little more like, uh, like this. But, uh, yeah, fortunately, this came out at a time when the more better and now accepted yeah however that said posture of the t-rex is now tilted forward like this it actually has nice proportions for a tyrannosaurus rex because not just because of the little arms and the big head and blah 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 but uh, you'll notice that the legs are actually quite i mean the, the thighs on this thing are rather huge and they're the hips are actually quite wide compared to the rest of, i'm trying to kill the perspective of here but, uh, yeah, that's that's something else they did that was really nice. Posability, already showed you the head. The little forearms, ratchet every 45 degrees. Tail, doesn't really pose. These ratchet every 45 degrees. 45, all the way around if you wish. And one of the nicer things about posability is swiveling ankle joints. These still have friction in them, folks. I think you'll find that I take very good care of my toys. This thing's 15 years old, and, well, for example, the most damage to the T-Rex is some of the decals have started peeling. I mean, started peeling, okay? And, uh, actually, I, you can't imagine how much dust was on this thing when I, uh, pulled it off the shelf a couple of days ago before I started filming. Anyways, yeah, this is the T-Rex. Next up is Black Ranger's Dinozord, the Mastodon Dinozord. One thing I never got to the mouth of Mastodon, if I can interject here real quickly, is why is it the head was dark gray when the rest of the Zord was black? I didn't get that. And th this is a very, very dark gray. This, like, this is typical dark gray right here, but this is very dark gray. I never understood why they did that. Anyways... Nice detailing on the legs. Problem I've always, 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 always had with the Mastodon was that the tusks, which you have to put on yourself out of the box, never quite held on there very easily. They've always been loose. This is not just age talking here. These were always loose. Same thing with the trunk. Even though you can move the trunk up and down, uh, let's see, how well can I show that? See, there's a little hole right there. By the way, you can uh, <coughs> pop the trunk off. Not much. So you can actually put it in upside down if you want to, but then it makes posing kind of interesting. But anyways, the trunk and the tusks never held on as tightly as I would have liked them to. That's it for the Mastodon. Next is Blue Ranger's Dinozord, which is the Triceratops Dinozord. That decal popped off about five years ago. Very nice detailing along here. The, the decals, nice detail right there, but the tractor treads, 
very awesome. Even even though you know it's kind of simple in some areas, I really like the detailing on the tractor treads. And these, uh, yeah, not so much the hollow tail, but mm. it's, it's kind of hollow underneath or blank underneath, blank there. Ah, there. Now the decal's in the right place. You have to put the two horns on yourself, although they can still pop off easily enough. I never liked... These were... It w not as bad a problem with the Mastodon, but the Triceratops' uh, horns, they did. You just push them in once in a while, they'd be fine. They, were, they would stay on a lot better than the Mastodon's tusks did. What you can do with the tail for its attack mode is you can flip it forward, and this thing swivels freely. And you actually have to hold the tail in position so it can do its attacking like it did in the show. Actually, I think it was something like that. But anyways, otherwise, if you let go, it'll just sink down as part of the transformation. Because this is a transformation joint. I wish it had locked into position here, but unfortunately it didn't. Simple enough, the Triceratops Dinozord. Next up is Yellow Ranger's Dinozord, the Sabertooth Tiger Dinozord. I wish the eyes had been red like they were in the show. I just painted them black. What? Nice detailing on the arms, though. Hollow on one side, but still. Nice detail. Nice decal detail. And more detail on the legs, which is nice. Unlike the Triceratops, the tail on this one actually has a bit more decent detailing to it. Decal in there is a bit boring, though. One of the things I never liked about the Sabertooth Tiger is technically it rests flat on all four feet like this. But it looks kind of boring this way, so something I've always done I actually put it down a little more. I mean, always, always, always put it down a little more. So it actually lifts it up a little higher. Unfortunately, it didn't have any head articulation to match, but that's just something I always did. Anyways, arm articulation is very generous at the shoulders. Very, very nice. Back legs, not so much. It's more because of the transformation like every 30 degrees or so. And the uh, the joint on the inside there has gotten a little loose, so it doesn't actually snap into place like it used to. It, it'll hesitate, but, you know, that's an age thing. And again, it's a transformation-only joint. Unlike the, saber, unlike the uh, Triceratops, however, the saber-toothed tiger's tail always had more friction, so you could always point it forward like this. Although why it was angled upwards, I could never figure out. Oh, well. And you had the option to move the saber teeth, tooths, toofers around as you wished. And a transformation joint in the neck. The saber tooth tiger. And last but not least is the pink rangers dinosaur, the pterodactyl dinosaur. Which is actually one of my favorites and not just because it flies. Like the, the panel detailing on the inside of the wing there. It has some great dynamics, too, though. It's, it's not just flat, but the wings actually curve upwards. And they also curve forward, kind of sort of like a pterodactyl's would. I don't know. Simple details mixed in with nice ones. Blah, 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 blah. And because of transformation, you could... Well, yeah, you could do that. Posability is pretty limited, again, because of transformation put that down like that so it looks like it's coming down like this which makes it pretty convenient for these paired blasters which I've forgotten the name of them at this point but you can um, plug them into the tail so that all, instead of always resting it on its belly and ruining up this nice decal here you can actually set it on a surface like this but I like to think that it would take this position for some really great dive bombing action but still, 
Nice Dino Zord. Summoning the Zords. What a special occasion. The music they played during the summoning of the Zords and when they were combining with each other was always something I looked forward to because it was just so badass. It was one of the very rare occasions in my life where I liked listening to electric guitar playing. So let's start things off simple with the Triceratops. Just flip this over. Done. It's kind of interesting though. Big difference during the transformation process in the show when this would fold up, there would actually be a peg that would be sticking out here. But uh, for the toy, not so much. Not so much. Yes, there were some definite echoes of Voltron in the Sabretooth Tiger. Transformation was pretty similar, too. And what kid, when they got the Deluxe Megazord, did not transform the Sabretooth Tiger this way? Because that's how they did it in the show. And officially, the teeth go upwards. Yeah, it looks better to do it like that, but officially, the teeth go upwards like that. Tyrannosaurus is quite easy. And something they don't show you in the show, because the saber-toothed tiger and triceratops have those pegs that stick out the back from underneath their tails, okay, um, it doesn't do this in the show. You won't see it do this in the show, but what you do, see this little black peg here? You push in on it, and the knee unhinges a little bit. So you see how it usually is here, and then here it is extended. And you have to do this in order for the attack tank mode to work out correctly. And this is pushed all the way in, so. And that's that. Not much of a change, but significant enough. Astodon is perhaps the most involved. This up. This up. Ten minutes ago, as I was, usually I store this set in Megazord mode. Well, ten minutes ago, I transformed it back into the individual Dinozords. And uh, I broke that clip in there. See, that's how it usually looks. And uh, yeah, that clip is broken. Oh, to the who. And then turn these one, two, three positions up. And there you go. Just like in the show, we're going to take the saber-toothed tiger and plug it directly over the kneecaps, the knee joints. And plug that in just like so. Actually holds quite nicely. Nice thing also about the attack tank mode, or at least the Tyrannosaurus, is you can actually hang on to the tail like a giant joystick if you want to carry it around and fly it around the room. However, the reason you loosen it up is because, well, it won't roll evenly if you do. But the problem is you scuff up the bottom of the tail. Take the mastodon arms, snap it in back, make sure it slides on properly, and then connect it to either side, like so. Take the mastodon head, flip this open, and peg it into place. Not very secure, but it's got friction, so it's good. Take the blasters from the pterodactyl and plug them in, like so. And the one thing that never made much sense to me when I was watching the show was, what happens to the pterodactyl when it's transformed into the tank mode? I actually had to get the toy in order to see this, because it's not very clear in the show. But what happens is, this tab here, now the other side here, what you're going to do is you're going to flip the wings over, make sure they pass that, and then you're going to peg it into the insides of the mastodon's feet. And there you have the dinosaurs in what the instructions call attack tank mode. So here's my question. Why call it attack tank mode when a tank's whole purpose is to attack? Hmm. Anyways, the nice thing about holding on to the tails is that actually 
levels and everything out. Th this is how it would rest on the ground in an ideal world, but unfortunately in the real world it'll actually slump down a little bit like that. So, yeah. And the legs will actually hold in this position, which is nice. All you gotta do is stick your thumb and forefinger up under there, under the uh, Tyrannosaurus's butt cheeks, and uh, there you go. I suppose I should just show you things like the arms. These were always a little wobbly, but mm. It's nice how the different angles of things, you've got an angle going this way, you've got one going this way, you've got one going the opposite direction, and it corrects itself here, and even the pterodactyl's pointed at a different angle as well. That's something I really like. A lot of people complained that the mastodon's head looked like it was just filler. Well, yeah, technically it is just filler. It's unfortunate, though, it's got that post right in there, because it makes, it makes the head stick out a little further than it needed to away from the test. Just didn't... It wasn't as compact or fit up as it should be, but eh, it works. I don't know why, but I liked having the wings of the pterodactyl left open. But I can kind of see why they did it, because it looks like some kind of a banner or something sitting across the top, which didn't make as much sense. But uh, yeah, the pterodactyl actually sits up there. Like I said, I didn't know that until I got the toy a couple months after the show started. It's like, where does it go? And yes, wheels here, wheels here. Oddly, only one pair, there's only one wheel on each of the back legs. There's supposed to be two wheels. And the tractor treads don't turn, so there's only a wheel there and a wheel there. But, the attack tank mode actually can... about. And for the longest time, I actually thought the shoulders were actually supposed to be pointed forward like this. Hmm. Like, years after the show ended, I thought that they were pointed forward. The first triple-changing Megazord in Power Rangers history. And also, just like in the show, it's actually easier to transform into Megazord mode because, well, most of it's already been assembled. Just a couple of quick things to get rid of before we transform this bad boy. There's one thing that they got right in the show, and that is that you have to tilt the forearms in a little bit in order to get the fist turned around. You actually do have to do that with a toy, and it's kind of cool because that's what they did in the show. Megazord sequence has been initiated. They didn't show you this part, but it was important. Put the tail, snap into place, and then a tiny little thing folds over like that. Now ordinarily at this point in the show, in the episode, the thing would just tilt upwards and that's it. Well unfortunately we've got some extra angles to deal with, which they never showed you. So you just squeeze these things here on the sides and snap it back down, and you do it like this. And then, you can, like this, then you can put your arms down. The pterodactyl comes in on final approach, flips over, up like this, and then the head just disappears as it gets closer. Well, what actually happens? The head does indeed flip backwards nestles quite nicely right there, and then the wings just flip over. Simple enough. Flip down this. Flip that down. Just back up. Peg in the pterodactyl. And something else they don't show you. Attaching the cannons to the back. And last, but certainly not least, and there you have the Deluxe Megazord. In my opinion, 
The Deluxe Megazord is perhaps one of the best proportioned Megazords that they ever designed. Very human-like. Except for maybe here and, oh yeah, the real tiny head. And speaking of the head, why did they decide not to paint the back of the head? I never understood that. Anyways, it's nice how everything is compacted in there very nicely. Just decal. Very nice, reflective. It, it's not reflective. It, it is reflective, but the extra Superman-like reflection is uh, part of the decal. Very nice decal, by the way. Very, very clean, very crisp. Very polished metal look to it. Like the rest of the decals on this thing. Articulation is as follows. 45 degrees all the way around. However... There is a little cheat you can use where you can use the transformation joint and tilt it inward. So that's actually a nice little thing to have. Double checking something. I always thought the cannons were a little puny sitting on the back there. It was nice that the cannons were there, but unfortunately, one, they never used them back there, and two, for the deluxe size version, they're kind of puny, kind of a little squat. Maybe a little too cute, you know? Eh, whatever. And the only other posability... Why am I putting that up? I don't care. Is in the hips. Because of transformation, you can actually put that leg all the way up. You could also point the foot down if you want to, but eh. So that's it for posability and details of the Megazord. However, there are a few accessories we must contend with. First off, we still have the Mastodon's head, which doesn't go anywhere in this combination. However, that peg has a nice little fit to it, and you can just fit it right there. Because that's one heck of a defense right there. I never liked the Mastodon shield. Never liked this. Too puny. It's just, eh, didn't do anything for me. And then, plucked freshly from the ground is the Power Sword. Very nice. Of course, this is very worn over time. But yeah, it is still vacuum metalized. It's not quite ABS. I think it might be a vinyl or something, because it is slightly flexible. It didn't strike me as straight on PVC, or ABS at least. And you can fit it into either hand. Although, ironically, because of the shape, the, I don't know if you can call it the guard, actually pushes up against the top of the, uh, the form, so you actually have to turn it to the side to get it to fit down a little better. But, you know, that doesn't really look all that better either. To hold your sword like this when you're fighting. Yeah. So just, you know, set it like that. And there you go. Much like Neon Genesis Evangelion did four years later, Power Rangers exerted an enormous influence on my life in 1993. Up to that point, I'd just been getting toys simply because they were toys, simply because they were cool looking. It took me several years to realize this after Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Season 1 ended, but the Deluxe Megazord was the beginning of my collection as it exists today. Now, I doubt that most of you could count on one hand the number of people that you personally know who have all the toys from before the collection as it existed. Yeah, there's a couple pieces missing here just because they were old and got thrown away. And there's also a few, such as Tallyhawk here, which are too big to put on this tabletop. I got this and you didn't. <laughs> But really what you're looking at here is how I got started in this. Not to get too off topic, but my dad had a coat closet of unbuilt Macross, Gundam, Dorvac models, which he claimed someday he was going to put all these together and he was going to detail the crap out of them and he was not going to have them colored toy-like. Ironically, about 95% of those models are still unbuilt and still attached to the trees. And then I also had a couple of Lego sets, which were always a big thing for me. A tub of Legos and then some dedicated sets, most of which I wouldn't be able to reassemble if my life depended on it because I'm missing some key pieces.
But what you see here, some more than others, are the honored and respected origins of my fascination with Japanese robots and such. And if it's not one of these two MicroMaster sets, either I got them before or after, I'm not sure, Dryas, 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 I don't know how to pronounce his name. I've had him for, what, almost 20 years now, and I still don't know how to pronounce his name. It took me a long time to find out where he comes from. Anyways, I believe that Dryas over there is the very beginning, the very beginning. Like, I had Legos, and then I'd build my own stuff, but that was... And by the way, this is my first Japanese import. This came f directly from a uh, Japanese foreign exchange student, our first one, in 91. She gave me the name of it, and that's all I've known about it ever. Up until about four years ago, I finally found out uh, what series it was from, and that's actually the bad guy over there. But who cares? It was an awesome toy, and it started this cute little wildfire. It started out nice and quiet. I got this for $20 secondhand. My parents got this for me for Pony Toy Go Round, from Pony Toy Go Round, whatever it was called. Uh, this was a gift, this was a birthday present, and everything else I bought myself. And it's just grown from there. But if you were to take a look at my bedroom, which is where I am right now, the cornerstone of my collection, which you will never see because my room is an absolute goddamn mess, would be the Deluxe Megazord. For eagle-eyed viewers who caught it in the first hour or so after it was published, that teaser trailer that I published a couple of weeks ago from One Many was originally had a different title to it. Like I said, if you caught it in the first hour or so after it was uploaded, it was actually called Every Generation Has Its Heroes, which uh, that wasn't very good. It wasn't. It, it just it, it sounded too Star Warsy, like every legend has its beginning, or you know. How many of these cheesy one lines could you come up with? And and, and I felt it right away. I was like, okay, that's not going to work. And some kind of pouring through my mind. You know what? What can I use as a substitute? I can't say what it is that's going to be teased because you have to be surprised when that electric guitar picks up. And it occurred to me that Power Rangers really was the beginning of my modern day collection, and how far it has expanded since then. Not just as far as the number of pieces in my collection but the number of series that I have followed. It was a beginning that expanded outwards like a tree from one many. Here's a little trivia point, though, and I'm getting way off topic. If you know on the U.S. dollar bills and coins it says E Pluribus Unum, which means from many one, well, I wanted to do the opposite of that, from one many in Latin, but unfortunately I couldn't find a Latin translation for it, so I just turned out to be just the English title, but if I could have done the Latin version of the title, I would totally have done that. So yeah, pre-Power Rangers nostalgia trip ends right about now. I was 10 years old when Power Rangers made its debut in 1993, which means I was way outside the standards for what the show was aiming for, which was for boys ages 4 to 7. And like many other boys younger than myself, I too had to put a Megazord on layaway because these things were just disappearing from the shelf so damn fast. Unlike 2011, the store shelves were just barren. Anything Power Rangers just gone. And the deluxe Dinozords were no different. But I worked my ass off and I earned my allowance for, I think it took me like a month to get it, which was long enough for the Toys R Us in Linwood, Washington to finally get one for me. And I brought that thing home, and, uh, <laughs> I, I still, I mean, I'm 28 years old now, so here it is 18 years later, I still get the warm, fuzzy, tingly feeling when I think about the early days of owning this thing. It was so awesome. It still is. Even compared to the Megazords of the 2000 aughts, this thing is a fantastic design. For me, there were two big things. One was the actual height. 12 inches of solid ABS plastic, which is saying something. If I may compare this for a moment to another franchise, which is called Transformers, they usually had a wide variety of heights, but never really 12 inches. They, they would get to about 8 or 9 inches, and please correct me if I'm wrong. The average transformer figure was anywhere from three to six or seven inches in height 
but not 12 inches. That was usually the big deluxe sized multi-mode transformers that had an electronic feature built into them. The legendary six shots, Power Master Optimus Prime, blah, 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 things like that. But the Deluxe Megazord was different from those in a couple of ways. One, it had animals for components, specifically dinosaurs, which you either liked dinosaurs as a kid or you didn't, and I was just, eh, okay, they're dinosaurs, whatever, I don't care. They were just awesome looking. And the other reason I got this is because of the size of it. My mind was blown when I got this thing. It was 12 inch tall transforming robot that was composed of five different animal shaped robots. That to me was just awesome. And you know, it didn't really bother me that they weren't posable in a lot of different ways. Yeah, it is nice that we can cheat with the hips and with the elbows, but at the time it wasn't really that much of a problem for me. Mostly because I didn't know better and my taste had not been refined enough to know better at that time. But the Deluxe Megazord, even in 1993, had an aura to it that no contemporary trademarked Transformer at that time could compare to. It just, it, it, it was untouchable in my mind. And even today, 18 years later, I fully and completely believe that the Deluxe Megazord has withstood the test of time. It is still an amazing toy, an amazing design. In fact, I only had two really big complaints, aside from the ones that I've already listed, such as lack of possibility in the Sabertooth Tiger, the Mastodon, the Mastodon Shield, which I never liked. And the first one was the proportions of it was very surprising. I, I, I really re honestly scratched my head when I completed the Megazord for the first time. I, the head is really tiny. Like, really small. That, that was confusing, because you watch a guy walking around in a stunt suit for months, and you expect the Deluxe Transforming Megazord to kind of represent that. And when that didn't happen, I was just kind of, wait, what? I actually complained to my parents. I said, Mom, Dad, the head is way too small. What's going on here? And they just kind of shrugged, like, oh, okay, that's just what happens. So that was something that took me a couple of years to get used to. And the other thing that drove me kind of crazy was something that was not quite as subtle as just having a slightly smaller head. And that is the decals. And this brings me to one of my favorite segments in the video review. Hey Ava, what's the difference between the Deluxe Megazord and its original Japanese counterpart, the DX Kyoryu Gatai Daijujin from 1992's Kyoryu Sentai Juranger? I know, I know, it's spelled with a Z, but it's actually pronounced with a J. Don't ask me why, I can't speak Japanese. Anyways, for me, there was a couple of big noticeable things. The first thing, the most obvious thing, is that these M's are totally different. It's supposed to be yellow background with uh, a much more stylized red-colored M sitting in there. And the other thing, the other more obvious one, is that there was some kind of weird lettering or whatever it was, blocky lettering along the side here, and very distinctly, a white TRI across the Triceratops right here. Which TRI, Triceratops? You know, that made sense. And then there was something sitting back here. But the one thing that never did make sense is, why is there this slightly less than nicely detailed lightning bolt there. There was supposed to be a zero and a something and a T or an I sitting something right there. So I knew that something was off, but I just wasn't quite sure why. Well, thankfully, now I have my answer. But instead, I'm going to whip this very, very wonderful mook out because it is so big and has very, very nice detailed pictures there is the DX Daijujin. And you can see, in Japan, they originally had the decals for the shoulders. And you can't see it here, but uh, let's see, can you? No, but you can see there's the, you can't see the TRI right there. You can see it along the hips there, along the side of the, um, what was that, the saber tooth tiger. So they did actually have those things in Japan at least. The other thing they changed, which which was actually kind of surprising, I don't know why, but they had the decal across the chest 
it was actually just a very simple line pattern as opposed to the one on the Deluxe Megazord, which had this very, very awesome and I would say generously improved decal design, which had this reflective metallic sheen to it, which that was pretty cool. I mean, the rest of it wasn't. You had, you had the... Um, what is it? You had the vacuum metalized plastic across a couple of different places and certainly across the sword, but to actually have it on something that wasn't detachable, something that you didn't have to take off of a tree and put onto the thing, that was a very, very cool, de that was actually my favorite decal right there. It was certainly better than those bloody M's or those goddamn lightning bolts on there. Why'd they put lightning bolts on there? They didn't have to do that, but they did. Although, to be fair, the replacement decals that they put on both the Triceratops and the Sabertooth Tiger, not that bad. I mean, admittedly, not that bad. So, um, yeah, if they, you know, change the shoulders um, and not put those lightning bolts on there, that probably would have been just fine. I would have scratched my head. I was like, why isn't there the lettering on the side? Because the lettering is English, and it wouldn't have made any sense to an English audience. I don't entirely agree with that, but... I can understand their reasons behind it. But otherwise, aside from those few little things, no problem here whatsoever. I should mention at this point, because I've been bugged about it relentlessly in various times, that there are websites out there which make fan-designed, customized decal sheets where you can actually put the official versions on there. Well, I mean, they're not officially licensed, but they do look like the original Japanese version. So those kinds of sites are out there. And yes, I've known about them for years and years and years. But to me, if I can just do a quick aside here, there's actually a little bit of a nostalgia feeling. Uh, yes, admittedly, it would be nice to have the Daijujin's decals sitting on there. But at the same time, the way this toy is now... I don't think I could justify doing it because then it would be hitting the nostalgia button, which is a very fickle thing for anybody. So, at this point in my life, leaving the decals the way they are is not a problem for me. Now, of course, this is 2011 when I'm reviewing this. In 2010, as Disney was shifting the rights of the Power Rangers franchise back over to Saban Brands, by the way, congratulations to Saban for doing that, they did release a completely new remold of the Deluxe Megazord with a hefty dosing of limb swapping introduced, which, why the f*** would they do that? Seriously? Oh my god, Bandai America! I can't tell you how frustrated I am that Bandai America has actually gotten stupider in the last 15 years. Changing a couple of decals because it might confuse kids when they got the toys. Okay, fine, I get that but completely remaking them to integrate components and gimmicks that weren't in the original version to make it more playable, that's just... Uh. Anyway, somebody else reviewed the Deluxe Dino Megazord for Collection DX, and that's not my job, and I never wanted one because I've got the original. Nye, nye, nye. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, this is a really awesome design. If you can still find one in the aftermarket, go after it by all means. It is a gem. And I loves it with all my heart. One other thing before I close this video out. This is a co-review, which means that two different people have reviewed this toy for Collection DX. While I am doing the video review on YouTube, make sure that you also check out Josh B's text and picture review over on CollectionDX.com. There's a link available in the comments section as well as in the closing credits. Wow, that conclusion ran way too long. But that music still gives me chills. This is Ava Unit 4A for CollectionDX.com, signing off. Hey.